Assalamu alaikum everybody and welcome to Step Up, the show for the 21st century Muslimah. In this series, we are looking at the issues that affect us as teenagers and how Islam is applicable for us, inshallah. I'm Hafsa and I'm Ruqayya. So can you really believe it's week five already? Oh, I can't, subhanAllah, it's gone so fast. So what's on the show today? Well, we start off with Ask Big Sister, where Big Sister Zahra will be on the hot seat answering our questions about what role the Quran plays in our lives. Can we really relate to a message that was revealed 1,400 years ago? And then I will be out and about with an organisation called Whammy, who are out on the streets of London telling Londoners about what Islam says about nature. Be sure to tune into that. In our upcoming talent segment, we'll be looking at an up-and-coming sister who started her very own successful business. Next, we learn more about the Sahabi and his amazing story. We have lots coming up in the next hour, so don't go anywhere. Today on Ask Big Sister, we discuss how to develop our relationship with the Qur'an and the role that it plays in our lives. I'm Sara, and joining me in this discussion, I have my lovely sisters, Khadija, who's 17 and currently doing her A-levels. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. We then have Atika, who's 17 and also doing her A-levels. Assalamu alaikum. And last but by no means least, we have Alicia, who's 15 and doing her GCSEs. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Okay, so sisters, the question that I have for you today is about the Quran. So there's 114 surahs in the Quran, of course, and every surah has its gems, it has its lessons. But my question for you is, what is your favorite surah? Or someone that you love reading, love listening to? Um, I'd say my favourite is Surah Fatiha. It was the one that I learnt, like the first ever surah I ever learnt when I was like six years old. And like yeah. every day when, yeah. I re when I do my namaz, it's just like... Yeah, yeah. that's a good, yeah, it's a good one. You know, the, I think the coolest thing about Surah Al-Fatiha is that whoever you, t if you teach it to someone, yeah. then like for the rest of the, your life, where you're reading it in your salah and everything, they get the reward for it. Exactly. So imagine yeah. all the reward that your parents are getting. That's it's, yeah. it's really cool. I want to be a Quran teacher just thinking about how much you, you get <laughs> out of it. It's awesome. Uh, me, oh, this is so hard. Yeah, no, <laughs> I mean, it is. It is a hard question. The thing question. with the Quran as well is that for me, like a surah has a specific kind of meaning to me at mm -hmm. a specific time in my life. But yeah. um, I think Surah Al-Rad is incredible. There's two of my favorite ayat embedded in it. Um, surah Al-Imran, Surah Al-Nisa as well. We're all women. Um, and, you know, our rights are embedded in this surah yeah. as well. Just all of them. I love yeah, them. Yeah, so basically <laughs> the whole Quran. Yeah. It's hard to pick and choose, yeah. <laughs> Um, for me, I think it would have to be Surah Al-Baqarah um, and it would have to be the story about because of the story of Ashab Al-Kahf, you know, the youth in the cave. Because yeah. yeah, I remember the halaqa that I went to when I, when I was taught about that, you know, that translation, that was just when it, I remember it first hitting me, like the, the Qur'an yeah. is it's something so relatable, like I never knew that Ashab Al-Kahf were so young, yeah. they, were, they are youth, they were yeah, like, you know, exactly. my age younger. So I think that was like a, a, a quite a connecting moment for me. I so think that was like one of the surahs or the ayat actually in Surah Al-Baqarah that I think everyone could actually relate to yeah. as like when you're learning about it because that's when you begin to realise that they're not figures in yeah. the Qur'an, they're they were actually real people, people yeah. and yeah. they're and so people. relatable. The distinctive factor of those people is that they were young. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so important for us like to, to read these stories and to, to drive lessons. Um, for me personally, it has to be Surah Taha. Mm -hmm. It's the 20th Surah in the Qur'an, so beautiful just to listen to. Um, it speaks about the story of Musa السلام, at length, which isn't unique to that Surah. But the cool thing about this Surah is the time that it was revealed. It was revealed at a time where the Prophet was going going through a lot of difficulties so it's kind of like a reassurance for him kind of like telling a story to make him feel better and when you read it with that in mind it's just so much more profound mm -hmm. and it's something that you can derive lessons from even today because of course the Quran is a well-rounded guide from Allah to the whole of mankind a manual on how to effectively lead a positive and impactful life it's a book that is applicable at all times and in all places but it's also a book that has been greatly misunderstood how can we come to an accurate and comprehensive understanding of the Quran and make it part of our everyday lives, especially when we're met with other obligations or even in terms of finding difficulty in understanding the Arabic language? To help us answer these questions, we have with us Sister Zahra, who's on the Ask Big Sister hot seat today. Sister Zahra, please join us. How are you, come, sister? How are you all today? Alhamdulillah. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Um, could you tell us a bit about yourself? So alhamdulillah, I'm going to university starting in September alhamdulillah, to study chemistry. Um, a bit about myself, I used to live abroad uh, for the majority of my life. Um, I only came to the UK three years ago and some people find that really crazy. <laughs> um, and um, when I was in college, I used to be part of the Islamic societies. I used to be quite involved. So alhamdulillah, I'm really excited for, to be a part of your show today. It's great to have you. So how did you find from moving abroad to coming here? 
Um, I think at first the transition was quite hard because you have to start cooking for yourself, you start cleaning for yourself, you have to do everything that your mum would have done because my parents are still abroad. But alhamdulillah, you learn to adjust over time. Yes, Pamela, that's really important actually because I've also spent the last year abroad and it's very difficult when your parents aren't around. Yeah, and you learn a lot about yourself as <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, definitely. That like you're very lazy. But, I, mean, <laughs> yeah. well, I can speak Especially for myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alhamdulillah. 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 I think that definitely applies. I don't know how I'd wash my own dishes. It's really bad. Um, so, yeah, as we said today, we'll be talking about the Quran. And I suppose, like, a big question or a big topic is that it's often um, perceived as almost outdated or inaccessible to the youth and you know a lot of people see it as something they can't it's not a book that they can pick up and look to for advice or just to read you know for leisure time they do other things but I suppose that comes into question the idea of what role should the Quran be playing in our lives and what role should it is it supposed to have in our lives Definitely, it's a really important question. I think, you know, when we're talking about this whole topic of the Qur'an, we have a lot of love for the Qur'an. You know, you guys are saying about the surahs and stuff that you really love. Um, it's really important when we're approaching the topic that we think we don't isolate the Qur'an from the rest of our lives. So I like to, when I explain it to other people, I like to think, you know, in your brains you have tiny little boxes. Yeah. So, you know, when you're in school, you go to the box that says school on it. Or when you're at home, you go to the box that says, you know, family or friends and things like that. With the Qur'an, you shouldn't have a box that says, you know, just the Qur'an or mm. preaching or doing da'wah. It should be a part of every single box. Mm. So if you have that attitude, you know, when you're in school, when you're in school, you're not just going to go to the box that has school written on it or the box that has homework written on it. You're going to go to, you know, if you did have that mentality, you know, you're going to go to the school box and you're going to have Qur'an in it as well. So, you know, in, in your lessons at school, for example, in your science lessons, when they mention, for example, you know, the beauty of Allah's creation, the planets, the stars, you know, how many billions of them there are, and we only live in a tiny aspect of the whole of the universe, you know, we'll start to think about these things and it becomes more a part, you know, that we come, come closer to the Qur'an over time. Even in maths, you know, you can even think about the Qur'an and how, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the Qur'an and enlightened us. So, you know, in the golden age under the, you know, when we had a state, the Muslims, they flourished so much in mathematics. Mm, and, you know, yeah, we brought a lot to this world. And, you know, if you isolate the Qur'an from the rest of your lives, you're only going to go to that little box when you're at home and you have free time. Um, but if you incorporate into every single aspect of your life, it becomes less of a chore and more of, you know, you're doing it for the sake of Allah and for the love of the exactly. deen. Yeah, and I think when you're talking about the golden age, you know, yeah. I remember like my maths classroom, it was filled with just um, all these Muslim scholars that yes, came up with all of these different algorithms and yeah. incredible things, mashallah. So you know what, Quran is a part of our lives that, um, you know, really enriches um, in terms of knowledge and, and things like that. So. Um, I think there's also a bit of a perception um, going around. Um, there's a bit of a culture of fear going on where you're told everything is haram, but you're not really yeah, told yeah. the reason why. Yeah. Um, and, and it's almost as if the Quran is a book of do's and don'ts. Um, and that's the perception, unfortunately, that some people have. So, you know, do you think that this is true? Do you think that the Quran is a do's and don'ts and nothing else? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go right, and say it, uh, right out and say it. You know, the Quran is not a book of just do's and don'ts. And there's two ways you can answer this question. One would be to say, look, you know, at the time of the seerah and the time of the Prophet wasallam, you know, when the Quran first came and the revelation first came, ayahs didn't come saying, oh, you have to fast, you have to pray. Ayahs came describing the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the beauty of the akhirah and the jannah. And, you know, it made people think. It made people think, why am I here? What am I going to do, you know? I want to really go to Jannah. You know, when you hear the ayahs about the beauty of the Jannah, you know, the, the rivers that are flowing, the fruits. Um, and that's how Islam came to us. It yeah. came, first of all, not as do's and don'ts. It came, first of all, to enlighten to the people, to make them start, you know, to get them to start thinking. Yeah, it's a really, really important point. Like, I feel like there's a general narrative, as Khadija was mentioned, of, like, scaring people into the religion. Exactly, I'm yeah. really passionate about this. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I think it's so important to copy the kind of curriculum that Allah used, yeah. that, you know, for, yeah, the first, yeah. the, for the first 10 to 13 years... 13, yeah, 13, 13 years, years, yeah. For the first 13 years, the, the Qur'an was solely based on what you were just talking yeah, about and yeah, um, increasing faith allowing people to fall in love with the religion exactly. so i feel like whenever you're put in a position to uh, communicate the religion with someone else to tell them about allah's mercy exactly. Exactly. tell them about the yeah. things that will even, will um you know develop their iman exactly i mean even if you look at the way the quran is laid out in many of the ayat um you have the beauty of jannah and the yeah, reward yeah. you can get yeah. and you shouldn't get to the part where it talks about um you know the hellfire exactly. and the horrible Definitely. kind of you know punishment you would get out of it yeah. so there's always that balance yeah. i yeah. think and the do's and don'ts they did come and you know if someone asks you this question you can throw it back at them and mm -hmm. say you know we live in a society right now do we not have do's and don'ts you know you can all like i don't know one of you guys give me an example of something in this country which would be considered breaking the law 
any don't example. Steal. steal, exactly. Don't steal. You can't murder. You can't go around on the streets doing whatever you want. So the society we live in right now, they do have do's and don'ts. And, you know, Islam, it did come with do's and don'ts. And, you know, when the, you know, the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina and they started establishing Islam, that's when the do's and don'ts started to come. So, you know, in Surah Baqarah and Surah Maida, you know, the rulings came out, you know, establish prayer, you know, establish fasting, things like this. Um, but, you know, you, again, throw it back at them and say, you know, we do live in a society where we have do's and don'ts right now. And I would much rather have do's and don'ts from the one who knows me best, yeah. from my creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, than have do's and don'ts from, you know, man-made laws, you know? Um, I think I really like what you said about um, how, you know, they, it did come. Yeah. Eventually, do's exactly. and don'ts did come. Because yeah. it's necessary to, to create a, a healthy society, yeah, mm -hmm. to have rules, right? Yes. But what's so beautiful is the Sahaba's willingness to follow them. Mm -hmm. And how, you know, people, they were so willing to follow the rules because they had that foundation of Iman. But um, what I wanted to ask you, though, is so that if we've established that the Qur'an isn't solely made up of do's and don'ts, we've also heard that the Qur'an is um, a living miracle. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean exactly? How is it? a living miracle. So you know when we look at the seerah, the stories of the Prophet even, we've always had um, prophets come but they come with a miracle. Um, so and the miracle is, is something which goes against the laws of or nature that we see today and every day. So you know when we had Musa salam, came he split the sea and when we had Isa, you know Isa salam, he could cure the sick by just mm -hmm. touching them. So the Quran is in itself as a miracle. Um, it came as a linguistic miracle and by that we mean that you know no one has been able to create just one ayah or one chapter like it. You know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah, so if you are in doubt of, with what we have revealed, produce a chapter like it, you know, bring all your helpers if you are truthful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And that is the living miracle that we have. You know, we have it in our phones, we have it in our pockets. It's amazing, you know, when you think about it, um, that no one has been able to replicate the style or the nature or the language of the Quran. Um, and so that's what people mean when they say that, you know, we live in a time where we have a living miracle. You know, the time of Musa, alayhi salam, it was splitting the seals. That's it. After that, it's gone. Isa, alayhi salam, when he passed away, that's it. The miracle's gone. Whereas we were so fortunate that we can just go out in our bags and pick up our phones and we have the miracle with us. Exactly. That just um, reminds me, you know, when the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi salam, died um, and so there, were, there was um, this influx of, like, fake um, poets yeah, trying yeah. to pretend they were prophets and they tried to, like... Um, create verses or so-called revelations and they were just so lame it was like <laughs> how, how, how do you think anyone's yeah. going to believe you but that just exactly. reminded me and exactly what you're is talking about the linguistics of the quran are absolutely yeah. incredible yeah, like mind-blowing exactly like yeah. I'm, I'm plowing through like this lecture and it's literally two hours long two hours and 15 minutes even on one a yeah. and the quran it's yeah. it's mind-blowing yeah, it it's really mind -blowing. is i remember Subhanallah. going to a tafsir on the um, surah fatiha and we, did, we had like three hours but we only got to two ayahs and i was yeah. like wow i thought it was going to go through like Surah Fatiha and a lot more of the surahs, but it didn't because exactly. that's how rich the Arabic language is. Each verse, oh. each each word has yeah. its own layers, has mm. its own nuances. Definitely. Yeah. Exactly. But as you said, like um, we have access to the Quran like all the time, like in our phone, yeah, yeah. Um, books anywhere. But like um, some people feel like um, just to get, like get the sole virtue of the Quran, it's like just to memorize it. Do you think this is? So, you know, like I was saying, we do live in a time where, you know, alhamdulillah, we have so many mediums that we can go to to, to look up the Quran, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, even just when I was coming here on my phone, I was looking it up, looking up by us, looking up the meaning of them. Um, and that has meant that it's become increasingly easy to memorize the Quran. And, you know, there is a lot of virtue in memorizing the Quran. You know, um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, um, it will be said to the companion of the Quran after he has entered paradise, recite and rise. Um, for every verse he recites, he will rise one level in paradise until he recites the last verse within him, in his memory. Like, subhanAllah, imagine, you know, you've memorized the Qur'an, you'll be able to get to the right, so to the beautiful. top. Um, yeah. But is, this, is the, the sole virtue memorizing? No, because there is an aspect of implementing at the same time. Oh, yeah. And, you know, there is another hadith, you know, Imam Ahmed narrates that the Prophet ﷺ said something. And then he said, that would happen when knowledge is lost. And then one of the Sahabas um, said, O Messenger of Allah, how can knowledge be lost when we have studied the Qur'an, we are teaching it to our children, and then our children will teach it to theirs. And the Prophet ﷺ, you know, he was quite angry. He said, woe to you, I thought you were one of the learned men um, of Medina. Can't you see that the Jews and Christians are not benefiting even though they have their scriptures right with them? So it's not just about having your scripture with you and memorizing it in your brain or having it. It's about implementing it. And, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, Allah's going to, elevate a nation through the Qur'an and he's going to degrade a nation through the Qur'an 
Or we don't want to be amongst those, you know, that were degraded through it. Because, you know, today, look at our society. We have so many people. You go to every mosque, you have about five, ten people who have memorized the Quran. But the society that we're living in isn't great because we're not seeing it being implemented. Exactly. And yeah. um, sis, could you like expand on that a bit? So there is, um, like you said, Allah subhanahu wa taala will elevate a nation through the Quran yeah. and degrade a nation through the yeah. Quran. How so? Like, what is it that and um, people can do in order to, you know, be degraded or be elevated through yeah. the Quran? So you know, if you just memorize the Quran, you're not going to be elevated through that because you're not implementing it. You know the the. The beauty of the Quran is you're not seeing it. You're not seeing it in society. So the Muslims in the past, they were elevated through the Quran. You know, we flourished. You know, we yeah. were talking about the mathematical, you know, the math and maths that they, you know, developed, the science that they developed. Even like, you know, I used to work in optics and optometry. You know, they said that the light actually was not emitted from our eye, yeah, but it was reflected in our eye. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas non-Muslims non at the time didn't know that. So, you know, the Muslims, they did become elevated through the Quran because they implemented in all aspects of society. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't just in, you know, econ economics. It was in, you know, the education system. You know, young Muslims, they were growing up, you know, thinking thinking about the beauty of Islam and how amazing it is and how many, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the whole world to our, our disposal. Um, so, alhamdulillah, that, that's how, you know, you can be elevated and degraded. Exactly. And you know what, when you were talking about um, being elevated uh, uh, and bettering the society we live in, actually an ayah came into mind um, that Allah will not change the condition of yeah. a people until they change themselves. Mm. Um, so I think when it comes to talking about society, we are a part of society mm. and it's all about changing ourselves. So how do you think, that, you know, practical steps, how can we implement um, the words of the Quran and the message that Allah sent down? Um, like, how can we implement that into our lives? And how can we change the society we live in? Yeah, so changing the society, there are, there are different, different aspects of it. There is, you know, changing ourselves and there is also changing the wider society, you know, in terms of, you know, politics, in terms of government as well. Um, so, you know, if you, if, you know, Allah SWT is always in the Quran and in the Sunnah as well, we're always encouraged, you know, when we learn something to spread it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you see a munkar, you know, you, you're supposed to change it. And if you can't change it with your hand, you change it with your, your mouth. If you can't change it with your mouth, you know, you, you, you disregard it in your heart. And Allah SWT, the Prophet SWT says, you know, that's the weakest of Iman. But, you know, there is this culture of always spreading what you learn. So you always take it out to society. If I learn an hadith and an ayah, you know, tell your sister next to you, you know, in school, in college. There, is, there are always opportunities to take Islam to another level, mm -hmm. as well as you know doing your own acts of worship, reading regularly the Quran. And I think the Fasir is really important in this yeah. aspect because we don't really necessarily have the Arabic language, and you know we need to look up the meaning to actually ha for the Quran to actually have an effect on our lives. And I think that knowledge is actually something really important. Yeah. Um, whether you're talking about because that knowledge we're going to be asked about on Judgment Day. You know, if we exactly. had beneficial knowledge yeah. and we kept yeah. it to ourselves, that's yeah. I think it's really important to highlight with this point that some people they find they find it difficult. They find it difficult to go ahead and share an ayah or share a hadith very innocently. You know, they feel like who am I to speak about this or or what do I know or and I think it's really important for these people to kind of recognize that it's an, it's a duty. It's a duty. Like yeah. the little knowledge that we have. Um, it's so important for us to give it to others. The Prophet said, said So to convey my message, to, to relate my message, to speak of me and, and to carry on what I've said, what I've started, even if it was just one verse yeah. of the Quran. So I, I just think that's really important to just kind of put out there that, you know, everyone's worthy. Everyone can, mm, everyone yeah. should. Yeah, so definitely. I mean, I think it's it's about fighting past that embarrassment or like stupidity, like I'm not really worthy or, you know, I don't know enough to say this. But I think it links back to what we were saying earlier about accessibility. I mean, I myself, I'm not an Arab speaker, so I don't understand Arabic. And there are many who are in the same situation. So for us that aren't familiar with Arabic, um, might find it difficult to sometimes connect with the Qur'an. I mean, how do we overcome this? How can we make it something that is accessible to everyone, Very even if there's question. a language barrier? Mm -hmm. I mean, we do, you know, that's it's a really important question because, you know, even me, myself, I don't speak Arabic and a lot of people, you know, they don't, the youth, they don't today. And it is quite sad, but it is is the reality that we face. And alhamdulillah, we have so many different avenues like we were talking about. You know, you have tafsirs all over the internet. You know, you go on YouTube, you've got like 100 people for tafsir of one IR. And, you know, you have your phones, you can record it, you know, when you're traveling to school and work. You know, if you, like one of my friends, she said, you know, whenever she prays and she reads a surah, that week she'll pick a surah and she'll look at that tafsir mm -hmm. so that every week she's, you know, increasing that, you know, that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we all want to know what, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us mm -hmm. in all of its depth. Um, alhamdulillah. And I, all, I would always encourage, especially the youth, you know, when you're young to learn Arabic. Mm -hmm. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, numerous times in the Quran, he says, you know, um, I have, we have revealed it as an Arabic Qur'an, so he's emphasizing the fact that it, this is the language of the deen and that we should learn it. 
Um, but don't be disheartened that you don't know Arabic because a lot of people don't and you can get that meaning by reading the tafsirs, by mm. talking to about people, yeah. by being the walking, talking Quran as they say, you know. Yeah. It is the language of Jannah, I exactly. think. Yes, it's, it's a precious language. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I regret it when I was not younger, not learning at a young age because your memory is so good when you're young. You just pick up languages exactly. really easily. Yeah. yeah. We were talking about the linguistics as well. Yeah. That's something yeah. like sometimes I read an ayah yeah. in Arabic. Alhamdulillah, I was brought up in a yeah. um, country that can speak um, Arabic. But um, like you read an ayah in Arabic and then you read the English translation, and it's like so much gets yeah. lost. Yeah. Translation. It's, it's a really beautiful language, and that should be a motivation, exactly. I think, yeah. to really get you know the yeah. Quran in its original language. Yeah, yeah. but even like Quranic Arabic is very different to like spoken Arabic. Mm. So so I think it's really important to to go ahead and and. Start Start small and have the intention of learning Arabic to understand the Quran, and it can be very overwhelming. Like I'm gonna learn Arabic, yeah. but yeah. It's just like that, like I said, just starting small, making it like a you know a evening class or is yeah, it Saturday definitely. Sunday class something like that. And every effort is appreciated by a lot. Exactly. Yes, yeah. and do it um, with other people as well. Because yeah, you know when motivating. you're in a, with a group of friends, it becomes a lot more motivating exactly. because yeah. you know at the end of the day we're humans. And when we're you gonna find um, a, a sheikh or someone yeah. that you can relate to exactly. immediately, yeah. Yeah. there's so many apps you'll find and lectures <laughs> you can download. Yeah. It's, it's it's really amazing. Yeah, yeah, apps and online resources, exactly. definitely. Um, so Zahra, I wanted to ask you about this sentiment that we've heard of a lot, especially here in the yeah. West, that the Quran is outdated yeah. or it's not applicable. Of course, this isn't the case, but yeah. where do you think this sentiment comes from? Well, it comes from an understanding or a false basis um, that I will expose by probably just asking you a few questions. You know, um, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu did people get hungry? Yeah, do they need food? Yeah. yeah. Do they need clothing? Like, you know, they needed to put clothing on themselves. Do they need houses? They need a roof over their head. Mm -hmm. Did they have like injustice or war or, you know, disputes between people? Mm -hmm. They did, didn't they? Yeah. And um, you know, when we think about it from that basis, you know, that human beings have not changed since the time of the Prophet or since yeah. the time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, she, you know, he revealed the Quran. People have not changed. You know, times have changed, yeah. Before they had camels, wasn't it? And it took like ages to get from one place to another <laughs> to send a message. And you know, now we have our phones, WhatsApp, in seconds you've got another person who's got a message from you. And yeah, styles and means have changed and the time has changed, but we as insan, we have not changed. Our, our instincts are the same, our needs are the same. We still need food, we still need clothing, we still need an education, we still need someone over us who rules us and who maintains, you know, the human beings. So I think, you know, when you, I mean, when people give you that question, they're coming at it from a false basis that mm -hmm. human beings, their innate nature has changed, but in reality it hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the Quran and the, the Islam has come for the whole of mankind and it won't yeah. change until... And, you know, like, I feel like from the same place, people say things like, you know, um, but why doesn't the Quran say this? Why yeah. does it say this and not this? Yeah. Or, like, kind of, like, um, you know, trying yeah. to figure out why something so important or something so relevant isn't mentioned explicitly yeah. in the Quran. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we learn is that um, my teacher said, would constantly say this to us that you know the Prophet Sallallahu and Allah they will be silent on things because there's wisdom in that exactly you know there's, there's yeah. flexibility in that yeah. so that it can the Quran and the teaching of Prophet Sallallahu can adjust and 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 you know um, fit for every single society in every single time yeah and, and there's nothing that's like concrete of course there are elements yeah. of the Quran that you can't dispute but exactly. with every story is something that you can re yeah. re relate with and yeah. for it for example, um, I was listening to a lecture yesterday about uh, Prophet Moses and the incredible oppression he was living in. That was like mind blowing. Mm. Um, and you know what? That is a lesson for us because we aren't living in a perfect society right mm. now, and there is incredible oppression going on all around the world. Yeah. And you know, the duty of one person to speak out, and they were defended, and they had Allah's barakah, and they had Allah's mercy on him. Um, you know, it is a lesson for us yeah. all, and it is a responsibility for us all. So I don't think that you know it's going to spell out for you that you know this person and this place, yeah. this is. What you're going to do? Mm -hmm. um, you, there are lessons in the Quran that every person can take from. I mean, it takes insight, doesn't it? Like it takes course, insight yeah. on your your part. Like you need to mm -hmm. you need to look through it, and you need to find the lessons, and you need to find how this will be applicable to your community and your society. Exactly. So the Quran, um, you know, can't, we've mentioned this before, but the Quran constantly pushes us to think and reflect, mm -hmm. and to think about how this book will help me as a person and help my, the community yeah. and the society at large. Exactly, treat it like your manual. Yes, yeah, your yeah, manual definitely. to life. Exactly. Definitely. Awesome. I think it's just the fact that because of how long ago the Quran was revealed, people think, oh, all these things, they don't apply to us anymore, but, but nothing's really changed. So, like, how could we, like, propagate the message of the Quran? Yeah, I think, you know, even with this question and the question before, 
Um, something which is key is having confidence in your deen, having confidence that Islam does have an answer to every single question that everyone comes up about. You know, if they have one question today, they have one tomorrow, we'll have an answer. Um, it's just about having that com uh, confidence in the deen. And, you know, how do we propagate it with confidence? So if someone gave you a book um, and they told you to sell it, if you've never read it before, you're mm -hmm. not going to be able to sell it very convincingly. Yeah. You probably won't have any luck at all. Um, so you have to be convinced in the messaging itself. You know, we're talking about the miracle. You know, think about these miracles. You know, how important it is and how important it is that we implement every single aspect of the Quran in our lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with confidence, you know, some people say, oh, it's, you get hesitant, you, know, you get shy sometimes and you don't want to say anything. But look at the Prophet, Prophet Musa, alayhi Allah SWT revealed the miracle to him and changed his stick into a snake. And he was still hesitant. He yes. asked Allah, you know, he said, you know, like, you know, make it easier for me. And we should also do that because even if you have the answer, even if you have, you know, the answer to all the questions that non-Muslims and Muslims may ask you, mm -hmm. without having that convic you know, conviction of Allah SWT and that closeness and that connection with Allah SWT, you're still going to find it difficult and to convey the message. Yeah, I think the responsibility lies with young people more than yeah, anyone definitely. else. I think it's really important for us to recognize that with us being in college environments and yeah. school environments, we're with people who are confused yeah. and people are trying to find themselves. So I think giving them the message is kind of one of the most vital things that we should do. So the responsibility definitely lies with us, I believe, more than anyone else. But Jazakallah khair sisters, great discussion, alhamdulillah. We've learnt that the Qur'an is an integral part of our lives and our actions should be a testimony to its applicability today in the 21st century. Obstacles of not being able to understand the Qur'an can be overcome with a sincere intention, available resources and dedication. The Qur'an is divine guidance and will not let down anyone who takes it on with both hands. So not only should we seek to do that for ourselves, but we should also help in facilitating its understanding to others, inviting them to share this way of life. We're off to a break now, but... Do tweet us and let us know your thoughts on our discussion. That's at Islam channel, hashtag step up. We'll see you in three. Aslam alaikum and welcome back to Step Up, the show to enable the young Muslim to step up in her deen. As a young Muslim, it is important to be involved in the community around us and be active in aiding others when we can. This is a part of what being a Muslim is all about. Today I meet an organisation that does exactly that, WAMI, which stands for World Assembly of Muslim Youth. It's a charity based in the UK which provides help to Muslim youth and aims to clear misconceptions about Islam. Let's find out more. Assalamu alaikum. I'm here today in Leicester Square take part in a youth-orientated da'wah event organised by WAMI. WAMI stands for the World Assembly of Muslim Youth and is a member of the UN NGOs and it served our community for more than 15 years. Today I'm here to talk to Amina and Khalid about what the organisation does and what this event is about. to work with WAMI? Well, it's regarding uh, da'wah and to propagate the truth about Islam and to remove this confusion that most people have today. So that's why I joined them. Why do you think it's important for young people to get involved with organisations like WAMI? It's very important. I think it's a duty for every single Muslim to be involved in da'wah and to invite people to the truth. What activities do you think young people can get involved with in their own time? They can, you know, propagate the truth by uh, giving some Quran for free, check with their friends if they can take them to the masjid, the closest masjid, introduce them to Islam, and just to give them the right information. That's the main thing. And it's duty for every Muslim.
We're doing an event today to remind people to look after the nature. Because uh, this is a, a plant, lavender. Yeah, it relaxes your mind. When you're stressed, uh, if you can't sleep, it makes you sleep. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you very much. We've just seen your amazing volunteers going up and down Leicester Square. So we're wondering, how was WAMI formed and why was it formed? We do mostly our projects in the community, the projects that nobody has done before. And alhamdulillah for, for the past 24 or 5 years, we have done projects that uh, would benefit the community. For example, there was no scouts before. There was no dawa so dawa training course. Alhamdulillah, we started the event. There was no dawa leaflet those days. So we produce good quality material. Alhamdulillah, everybody does it. Then we start doing unique projects, like today, the one you see, the nature one, so that the other people will learn from it. And the aim of all these projects is to remove the misconception that the public has because we notice there is a lot of misunderstanding when we talk to the people in the town center. And they usually ask us where the Muslim community is, uh, why they're not coming out, why they're not sharing uh, and removing misconceptions. So what future plans does one we have in terms of projects? I mean, anything which benefits the, the community uh, because the, the public, the British public, they're very nice. They're very welcoming. I was in Birmingham. One lady, she gave me a handmade scarf because it was very cold. And she said to me, uh, when we were giving this lavender gift, she said to me, look, I've got lavender on my arm. And she said, look, you Muslim community, you care about nature, so I would like to give you a gift. You see? And that, uh, the funny thing was that day it was freezing cold. And subhanAllah Allah sent her to give me the scarf to put on. You see, you meet some really nice people. Alhamdulillah, what really makes me happy is that most of the volunteers that I get assistance, at least they're coming out rather than staying at home. So we give them opportunity to come and present on the sister side, you see, so they can express themselves. What is it? It's a lavender. Uh, it's a plant. It relaxes your mind. Thank you. You are brilliant. Take this as well. We're doing this event today to remind people to look after the nature. So, Jazakallah Khair, for, brother, for coming here and, and speaking to us about the amazing stuff that Wami's been involved in. We really appreciate it. Jazakallah. As you have seen today, Alhamdulillah, it's been a very beneficial event. And it's important to remember that we need to tackle the misconceptions in Islam as well as spreading the beauty within the deen. The Ummah is extremely dependent on the youth and it's always been the young who have been at the forefront of furthering Islam. What a great job they're doing, mashallah. It's such a beautiful way to reach out to people by giving a free gift bag containing a beautiful message from Islam. And it's amazing how people respond to such a kind gesture, alhamdulillah. Moving on to our next segment, we now meet a sister who has started her own very successful business, MashaAllah. Let's find out how. My name's Dina and I'm the co-founder of Mubarak London, along with my sister, Shadida Ahmed. We created Mubarak London together. We're mothers with children. We felt like we wanted to do something new, something different. Nowadays, everybody's you know, independent and doing their own thing. So we want to create something a bit more refreshing though. So we revolutionized the hamper basically and came up with Mubarak London. When we first started it, you know, it's just two mothers with children with a big idea and just seeing how it goes. You know, they, we didn't think it would explode as it has done. But Alhamdulillah, it's just amazing. The duas that we've been getting from people, the orders obviously, and um, the demand, I think, one of the biggest milestones would have to be Ramadan and Eid. 
Um, I personally didn't anticipate for it to be this big. Uh, whereas my sister, she kind of knew. She was just like, no, we need to be prepared. It was only when the orders started really coming through about Fajr, Zuhr, everything, like you name it, all times of the day we were getting orders, alhamdulillah. It was really, really nice feeling to see how many boxes we made. I could confidently say in, in a week we must have done over 60. My inspiration is just seeing women in general, those ones that have really made it. But the main thing is mothers. Um, being a mother has changed my life completely. I, f I find it as it's such a challenging role, such a challenging role, you know. I've done a nine to five job as well. I've worked in big corporations, you know. Um, and then I stopped after I became a mother and now I'm a mother of two. So I find balancing both sides, being a mum and being a business owner, as you might want to say, it's not easy. So my inspiration ultimately is more I look at women that are going out there and working and have businesses themselves, small or large by the way, you know. I just think women that are um, mothers, you know, working mums as well and even if you're not a working mum but you've got children and you're, you've got a business and you're working, I just think that's inspiration as a whole. I know I wanted to do something for the Muslim people. I know I want to do that. In some way, whether our boxes are made for non-Muslims to give to Muslims, or Muslims to give to Muslims, or even non-Muslims, but we wanted the Islamic element in there, you know, sentimental, be it educational, whatever. So the du'as that we get from people is just amazing. I cannot emphasize to you, I mean, the messages we get via email. When we first launched, like within the first hour, we must have had so many messages via social media, just to give us a pat on the back and give us du'a to say, wow, you guys are amazing, this is an amazing idea. So that in itself is, is, is wonderful, it's the feeling you get. And someone you don't know giving you du'a, I'll take that. The other part is um, the support, family support. Our father is so passionate about this, it's quite funny. He'll come over, he'll say, so how many orders did you get? So <laughs> his passion is beautiful. And our husbands are supportive. Um, our children are supportive, they'll, they'll come when the stock's in, when we get a big stock delivery, they'll come and unpack. It's nice having a little family business, but one that we're all proud of, we're happy about, and that makes other people smile as well. What, what really makes us proud is, because we're gifting, any gift business will know this, the pleasure is that we create it, but somebody else is gifting it. So you're making not just the person receiving it happy and smile, but also the person gifting it. So that's the beauty of it, you know, we're, we're inshallah spreading the smiles as well, so that is definitely positivity, I think. What is absolutely fundamental for me is the planning stage. I put a solid business plan together from numbers, costings, researching, getting out there. The funny thing is, Mubarak London has been set up 90% via email and you won't believe this. So I would do it after hours, I would sit on my laptop and write about 20, 30 emails to businesses, you know, the, for the corporate stuff that we needed and suppliers and things, and um, I would schedule them my emails to go out at in the morning because obviously it's all down to professionalism. If I send an email at 3 a.m. it just doesn't look good. I would actually create them 3 in the morning but have them scheduled to go out in business hours. I had a case study put together, a little business plan, one for suppliers, one for the bank, one for myself. Until this day I look back at my business plan to see if I'm on my mission, goal and stuff. Plan what you want to do. Then sit down and think is this for the money? If you're doing it for the money, it's not gonna work. If you're doing it for the passion and you love doing what you're doing, then it will work. Any business person will tell you, entrepreneurs if you wanna call it, you know, millionaires. They don't start off with just for the money, it's the desire and the passion for what you're doing. It's that that will make it rise and make it excel. The money is secondary, yeah? So the money, of course, makes the business, but if you love what you're doing and other people love what you're doing, it should come through.
It's so great to see more and more sisters getting into business. Just like Khadija radiallahu anha, mashallah. An inspiration for us all. I hope there's an increase in the number of sisters who are earning in a halal way, inshallah. Well, we are now off to break. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. You're watching Step Up, the series for the young Muslimah. When we read back over the Sirah, we find many of the first Muslims accepted in Islam and made great sacrifices for the deen while they were still young. They saw the truth and the beauty and the conviction in the message and embraced it with an open heart. So we come to our Young Sahaba segment, where we take a look at the stories of some of these incredible individuals. Who are we looking at today? Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. Abdul Rahman was one of the first eight people to accept Islam and was also one of the ten companions who were promised paradise. His name during the days of Jahiliyyah was Abu Amr. However, when he accepted Islam two days after Abu Bakr did, the Prophet ﷺ changed his name to Abdul Rahman, servant of the beneficent God. When Abdul Rahman arrived in Medina during the Hijra, the Prophet ﷺ paired him with an Ansar named Sa'ad ibn al Rabi'ah. And this Ansar offered Abdul Rahman one of his two orchards and also offered to divorce one of his wives for him. Instead of accepting this generous offer from Sa'ad, he said, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless your family and your wealth, but just show me where the market is. Abdul Rahman went to the market and traded the little wealth that he owned. He bought and sold and bought and sold until his wealth began to grow rapidly. Soon he had enough to get married. When the Prophet called upon the companions to give generously for the war effort for the sake of Allah, their response was immediate and generous. But in the forefront of those who responded was the companion, Abdul Rahman. He donated 200 alqiyya of gold, whereupon Umar ibn al-Khattab said to the Prophet, Abdul Rahman has committed a wrong. He did not leave anything for his family. So the Prophet ﷺ asked Abdul Rahman, Did you leave anything for your family? Yes, he replied. I left them more than what I gave and better. How much? asked the Prophet ﷺ. And what Abdul Rahman replied is surely something that we can all learn from. He said, What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger have promised of sustenance, goodness and reward. From this we can learn about the virtue of giving fi sabilillah and understanding that when you give, it purifies your wealth and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless us with even more than we gave in this dunya and in the akhirah. So next time you buy something like a box of chicken wings and your friends ask you for one, give it to them with the intention of pleasing Allah. And just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised, He will bless you with even more than you gave. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for us to follow the path of the righteous and remain on it. Ameen. Well, that's it for this episode. Next week, we discuss the issue of our identity. Do we identify ourselves as Muslims first? We'll also be looking at a new inspirational Sahabi. And we look at how we can be vocal in our communities to protect local wildlife. Catch us again, same time, same place, next week. Make sure you tweet us and let us know what you think of the show at Islam Channel, hashtag step up. Until then, salams from all the team. Assalamu alaikum. Get the word card. <laughs> In the card. In the card. About the Quran. Quran's awesome. Great book. Everything. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry. How to effectively effect. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs>